Hello and welcome to Santorini Day. We're delighted to have you with us as we speak today with the writer and translator, Peter Wartsman. I'll briefly introduce him, then he will read from his texts and we'll have a conversation about his writing, about translating, and maybe even life in general if there's time. Uh, his, for his biography, Peter Wartsman is the author most recently of a bilingual German-English collection of stories, Stimme und Atem, Out of Breath, Out of Mind, and the second edition of A Modern Way to Die. His past works include another collection of short fiction, Footprints in Wet Cement, a novel, Cold Earth Wanderers, Cold Earth Wanderers, shortlisted for the 2014 Indie Fab Science Fiction Book of the Year Award, an independent publisher's book award-winning travel memoir, Ghost Dance in Berlin, book of doc and a book of doctors' profiles, The Caring Heirs of Dr. Samuel Bard. He has also written two stage plays, Burning Words, which premiered at the Hampshire Shakespeare Company in 2006 and was produced in German translation at the Kulturhaus Osterfeld in Pforzheim in 2014. His other second play, The Cat Tattooed Man Tells All, first staged by the Silverhorn Theater in Greenfield, Massachusetts in 2018, is slated to be staged in a German translation at the Deutsches Theater in Göttingen in 2020. His travel writing and other expository prose has appeared in the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, Der Tagesspiegel, Die Welt, Die Zeit, The Paris Review, Literary Hub, and other newspapers, journals, and websites in the US and abroad. He was selected five years in a row from 2018 to 2012 to be included in sorry about that um, his writing was selected five years in a row 2008 to 2012 and again in 2016 for inclusion in travelers tales the best travel writing his travel narrative protected won the 2012 gold grand prize for best travel store of the year and the solace awards for best tra travel writing Wurzman is also the critically acclaimed literary translator from German into English of works by Adalbert von Hamiso, The Brothers Grimm, Heinrich Heine, E.T.A. Hoffmann, Franz Kafka, Heinrich von Kleist, and Robert Musil, among others. To start, Peter is going to read from the introduction to his latest book of uh, fiction, the bilingual Stimme und Atem, Out of Breath, Out of Mind. Okay, Peter. Thank you first to Marianne Newman for organizing this virtual book festival in these very unsettling times when we are all sequestered as if in a global witness protection program from a powerful, albeit invisible, microscopic malefactor. Thank you, Tess Lewis, dear friend and colleague, for moderating this panel. Thank you all for tuning in and listening. Permit me to get, begin with an excerpt from the afterword to my bi new bilingual German-English book of stories, Stimme und Atem, Out of Breath, Out of Mind, published by Palm Art Press in Berlin in 2019 and distributed in the U.S. by Small Press Distribution. Once, after heartily and gamely shooting the breeze over Germ Russian bubbly at a congenial gathering in the former GDR, the Polish wife of a German friend asked me what, in fact, my mother tongue was. The conversation in which I took a lively part, vigorously affirming and defending my points of view about this and that, was conducted entirely in German. While I communicated shreds of the essential gist in French to my French wife, and every now and then scolded in English my young son, who two years of German instruction notwithstanding, made not the slightest effort to engage a few German words with the neighbor's delightful little daughter. Reflecting for a moment, I gave the following answer. My mother tongue is actually a kind of linguistic rap. With German, the language I spoke for my entire life with my mother, enveloped by English, whereby I am quite sure that there are forgotten Yiddish sentiments slipped into my eccentric German, the Yiddish in turn still studded with Hebrew longings, smuggled out of the desert, the whole generously salted with tears and seasoned with screams. Given that I learned German as a first language, 
albeit not oral, not only orally, from my mother. German is and remains for all intents and purposes my mother tongue. But I grew up in English, and since I only learned to read and write German much later as an adult, it remains for me a language of childhood, or rather a delinquent dialect. As such, he who bears the name Peter Wurzman keeps stumbling on a second I in the clang of German syllables, the Mr. Hyde to his Dr. Jekyll, a shamelessly impertinent creature who allows himself to take liberties that my well-brought-up adult English-speaking eye would surely have censored. To have reached at age 66, after years of considerable creative effort in English, the beginner's level in another language is, in my view, no small feat, something on the order of digging a hole so deep into New York granite that you come crawling back up in China, filthy but still breathing. If as an adult I stutter and stumble with the shaky spoon of my tongue back into the still fluid forecourt of consciousness the German constitutes for me, I do so in full consciousness as an English speaker reminded of other syllables that say more to me about the unspeakable than yes and no. Let me lay it on the line, even if it sounds a bit bizarre. I have long suspected and am now convinced that I harbor a stillborn scribe of the German tongue in me, who, despite everything, belongs to the literary tradition from Kleist to Kafka. As a translator, I have a very intimate relationship to that tradition. Every word is an air bubble, every sentence a breath, an exhalation burdened with meaning. With his ear pressed to extinguished lips, the translator acts as a kind of medium who literally derives inspiration transmitted by strange syllables. Translation from one language into another, particularly the words of the dead, is a kind of mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation in which you breathe new life into expired thoughts. As a writer, things are a bit more complicated. German, for me, if I can be perfectly frank, also harbors a dark subtext. The language of the Dichter und Denke, poets and thinkers, to whom I, in my own modest way, feel a certain kinship, is also the language of the Richter und Henke, judges and executioners. In Auschwitz and Buchenwald, they not only murdered people, they also once and for all time erased the tenuous borderline between nightmare and reality, and thereby devised a new marginal tongue in which consciousness and the subconscious blabber like undivided Siamese twins. Sayings like jedem das seine, to each his own, and Arbeit macht frei, work makes you free, and concentration camp jargon like Muselmann, a walking dead man, and Kanada, the depot in Auschwitz-Birkenau where the last possessions of the slaughtered were saved and stored, thus the epitome of limitless riches and boundless possibilities to speak a black humor that arouses a tickle in the throat that can never be stilled by easy laughter. I am also heir to this German tongue. Let me move on to a very brief two takes from Stimme und Atem. These I want to say again, all of these texts were first written in German and then adapted into English. Family members. Family members are not like other people. They are attached to each other by thin, invisible wires at every movable part. As distinct from marionettes, however, whose strings all stretch upwards to the fingers of the puppeteer, surreptitiously directing their fate, the wires of domestic life are horizontally strung binding spouses and their progeny like the members of a chain gang. One could well compare these domestic desperados to a wagon team, though the family drags nothing forward but itself. It advances rather like a jellyfish teased by the tides, driven hither and thither by the currents of jealousy and love, never going anywhere until one by one the members miraculously break free, each in his own way, defining himself and dying in the process. Nice, cheerful uh, 
take on family on family values, I guess. Uh, let me just read you one very short story. This one, more or less taken from life, although uh, I don't believe in the very notion of nonfiction, all is fiction. The One-Eyed Tomcat, or The Theory of Waves. I was seven or eight at the most. It was a hot summer day. The others were having fun at the beach. I sat alone on the front porch of our rented bungalow, gazing at the deserted street, waiting for something to happen. And suddenly a tomcat leaped up and landed in my lap. He was dust gray and dirty, with one eye missing. His filthy rust-colored orange fur was scratched away in spots. My mother wanted to chase him away. You had a cat too in London during the war, I protested, and she relented. After he had slurped up and emptied the bowl of milk my mother set out for him, he wanted nothing more than to be scratched under the throat, shutting his one eye, emitting a raspy and contented purr. And once he had recouped his strength, he opened his eye again to gauge his chances, lifted himself slowly but decisively and leapt back into the street. The summer was almost over, we would soon have to leave our bungalow and go back to the city. What if some other tomcat scratches out his good eye, I asked my mother. Cats have whiskers growing out of their cheeks that help them slip out of tight fixes, she assured me. What happened to your cat in the war? My mother shrugged. A week after our return to the city, a fierce hurricane tore the trees and tele telephone poles out of the ground and, and scattered them like pickup sticks. There were TV reports of flooding on the shore. Can cats swim? I asked my mother. Water's not their element. They can scramble up a wall, she said. The next summer we went back. The first week went by and then the second. I sat on the porch waiting. I wouldn't have been able to think it through, but I sensed that there would be no miracle this time, and that the boredom would be never ending if I didn't do something about it. Until then, I had a terrible fear of the ocean and only went unwillingly to the beach. I would wall myself into a sand cast, inside a sandcastle fortified with high ramparts till the waves came and made short shrift of my safe haven. In a fit of fury, I jumped up and flung myself into the water and was immediately knocked down by a wave, then another and another, until a big kid taught me how to catch the waves and ride them. There are waves on dry land too, as I would learn much later, only they are invisible and therefore much more difficult to recognize and ride. I stopped being afraid of the deep after that, but I did develop an allergy to cats. Thank you, Peter. You talk in your um, introduction of the Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde uh, between the two languages. So my, I was wondering if the experience of writing similar texts in the two languages are different. And your last um, story made me think of perhaps for you switching from English uh, from the use of one eye to German, the use of whiskers to feel your way through language uh, might be uh, one metaphorical way of understanding what's involved in that switch. That's a very apt point, I have to say. Um, I am another in each language I speak. And I believe that's the case for all of us who speak more than one language. German is a particular challenge because the fact is I have less of a vocabulary in German and I don't have the adult mastery of German that I have of English. But for that same reason, German remains what I call my access to the left hand of consciousness, my kindergarten self that hasn't yet, like my adult self, uh, made learned how to be an adult, learned how to be sensible. My German self 
is unsensible, foolish, naive, uh, uncensored, really a Dr. Jekyll. But by then bringing it into English, I can apply an adult grammatical mastery over the lines. So there's, I, I really love the dialogue between these two sides of myself, these two selves inside me. Was, and do you find that the texture and the feel, the atmosphere of the stories that you write in English to be different than those to those that you write in German? Absolutely. Uh, my German stories are elemental. I feel like I write them with, I don't know what your experience of kindergarten was. We had these large building blocks and myself being a very introverted child, I used these blocks to build a wall around myself that the teacher had to tear me out of because I just wanted to be alone. I feel when I write in German, like I am writing with these giant building blocks and writing these elemental, big, big blocked stories. I, I don't know how else to put it. They say something in the language itself that I couldn't say in English. Mm -hmm. So do you find the English adaptations of them in the, in your, uh, bilingual edition, Stimme und Atem, Out of Breath, Out of Mind, to be, was it a disappointment or are they just simply different texts? They're different texts. The German gives me access. I'm like a miner digging. The mm -hmm. German gives me access to this domain. And in a sense, if I want to continue the metaphor, I find precious ore, which I can then in my English uh, scratch away, refine, perfect, so, so to speak, mm -hmm. right? So they are different texts, but the one gives me access to a domain that I can refine in the other. It's interesting that you talk about um, the sense of the elemental in when you write in German, because you seem to be drawn in your translation life to um, writers that have a, an elemental aspect to them, whether it's the Brothers Grimm or Monona um, I think that you can talk of Kafka as elemental because he strips he strips language and narrative down to um, really elemental bare bones. I'm not sure I would call Musil or Altenberg elemental, but maybe they're the exceptions that prove the rule. Uh, Altenberg, I would. Altenberg, yeah. I would. There's a there's a childlike quality. That's true. Uh, right. Not less so in let's so in Mr. Muzo. Yes. Um, do you do you tap that elemental side of yourself when you translate? Oh yes. Uh, especially, I have the luxury at this point of my life my my life of translating just what I please, just what I want to translate, and I have a wonderful publisher, uh, Archipelago Books, uh, run by Jill Schoolman who permits me to propose just what I like, just what I want. And so this, it's a, it's a great privilege. And the writers that I love, maybe most of all Kafka, have this elemental quality, also have this quality of tapping their dreams absolutely directly in their writing. Kafka has this amazing ability, to my mind, present in my favorite writers, to write of the ineffable in a crystal clear, almost bureaucratic language. One could say the same of another writer I translated, Kleist. One could say of him as a soldier, he, trapped, he tapped this ineffable in this uh, military almost uh, regimented language. And it's that contrast, that parallel between a dream zone and a very rational, well-constructed architectural sentence that to my mind makes great literature and that I love certainly in the translation that I do. Well, why don't you give us a taste of the writers you love um, and read the three excerpts or excerpts from three of them anyway to both give us a sense of, of like I said, the writers that you love and also uh, the versatility of voices 
the range of voices that you've brought into English. Okay, my pleasure. I'm going to start with uh, a, a text by Peter Altenberg. Uh, I should say that I am the child of refugees, Jewish refugees from Vienna, and so I have a particular relationship to Viennese culture, a prickly ambivalent relationship to a culture that after all sent my parents packing. Um, this book, if I have the moment to say it, came about because I had stopped translating completely. I had been cheated by uh, a past publisher whom I won't mention, but who said in one conversation when we were drinking beer together, I got you for so cheap. And I felt disgusted and I'd stopped translating. And then I met my dear friend, Jill Schoolman at a party at the creation of this press. And I said, well, I don't translate anymore, but if I did or someone did, somebody really ought to translate this guy, Peter Altenberg. And so I put together this book, Telegrams of the Soul uh, for Jill, which has done quite well. This is a text called In the Volksgarten. The Volksgarten was and is a, a public garden in the center of Vienna. I'd like to have a blue balloon. A blue balloon is what I'd like. Here's a blue balloon for you, Rosamunde. It was explained to her then that there was a gas inside that was lighter than the air in the atmosphere as a consequence of which, etc., etc. I'd like to let it go, she said, just like that. Wouldn't you rather give it to that poor girl over there? No, I want to let it go. She lets the balloon go, keeps looking after it till it disappears in the blue sky. Aren't you sorry now you didn't give it to the poor little girl? Yes, I should have given it to the poor little girl. Here's another blue balloon. Give her this one. No, I want to let this one go too, up in the blue sky. She does so. She is given a third blue balloon. She goes over to the poor little girl on her own, gives this one to her, saying, you let it go. No, says the poor little girl, peering enraptured at the balloon. In her room, it flew up to the ceiling, stayed there for three days, got darker, shriveled up, and fell down dead, a little black sack. Then the poor little girl thought to herself, I should have let it go outside in the park, up into the blue sky. I'd have kept on looking after it, kept on looking. In the meantime, the rich little girl gets another ten balloons, and one time Uncle Carl even buys her all thirty balloons in one batch. Twenty of them she lets fly up into the sky and gives ten to poor children. From then on, she had absolutely no more interest in balloons. That stupid balloon, she said whereupon Aunt Ida observed that she was rather advanced for her age. The poor little girl dreamed. I should have let it go up into the blue sky. I'd have kept on looking and looking. You're right about that, that childlike um, observation that sees far more, uh, far more than perhaps um, is pleasant to see. I want to say it's apt for the for this festival that we're at, that childlike observation is particularly apt. I don't know if you who, you know who it was who discovered the Altamira cave up in Basque country. It, no. This is not Catalan, but this is Basque. Uh, there was an amateur archaeologist and local aristocrat who was wandering around his grounds, and suddenly his dog disappears in a hole in the ground, and his ch his daughter, maybe children, uh, several children followed after him, and they come out yelling, bisons, bisons, and the, 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 <clears throat> the landowner follows his children into the cave, and he sees nothing because the adult head goes only parallel at one level and doesn't look upwards, yeah. but the child head peers at the ceiling, and the child saw the murals, these magnificent prehistoric murals on the ceiling. That's what I mean. Yes. Yeah. And when I write in German, or when I translate from German, it permits me to move my head all over the place and see things that I wouldn't necessarily see as the fuddy-duddy old man that I am. Um, now we'll 
you'll read New Zeal, which is certainly not fuddy-duddy <laughs> or childlike. Not, not, not fuddy-duddy, but a wonderful, wonderful, a writer with a wonderful capacity to combine intellect and emotion, uh, more so than almost any writer I know. The only one who comes close, I think, is Vladimir Nabokov in this ability. Clear hearing. Oh, this is from the book titled Posthumous Papers of a Living Author that uh, Jill Schoolman Archipelago Books brought out in its third edition. Uh, it, so it, this has done quite well, this little book. I went to bed earlier than usual, feeling a slight cold. I might even have a fever. I am standing, I'm staring at the ceiling, or perhaps it's the reddish curtain over the balcony door of our hotel room that I see. It's hard to distinguish. As soon as I'd finished with it, you two started to undress. I'm waiting. I can only hear you. Incomprehensible, all the walking up and down in this corner of the room and that. You come over to lay something on your bed. I don't look up, but what could it be? In the meantime, you open your closet, put something in or take something out. I hear it close again. You lay hard, heavy objects on the table, others on the marble table, on the marble top of the commode. You are forever in motion. Then I recognize the familiar sounds of hair being undone and brushed, then swirls of water in the sink, even before that clothes being shed. Now again, it's just incomprehensible to me how many clothes you take off. Finally, you've slipped out of your shoes, but now your stockings slide as constantly back and forth over the soft carpet as your shoes did before. You pour water into glasses three, four times without stopping. I can't even guess why. In my imagination, I have long since given up on anything imaginable while you evidently keep finding new things to do in the realm of reality. I hear you slip into your nightgown, but you aren't finished yet and won't be for a while. Again, there are a hundred little actions. I know that you are rushing for my sake, so all this must be absolutely necessary, part of your most intimate eye. And like the mute motion of animals from morning till evening, you reach out with countless gestures of which you're unaware, into a region where you've never heard my step. By coincidence, I feel it all, because I have a fever and am waiting for you. That's lovely. This last section, this last selection rather, of Kafka, I asked you to read because I think it has a particular resonance uh, for the current situation. Yes, because dear Franz was quite an introvert but like all introverts, uh, something of a voyeur, uh, lo certainly loved, loved to look windows. So this short text called The Street Side Window comes from, uh, comes from a book called Conundrum, Selected Prose of Franz Kafka, Conundrum with a K, which again, my uh, dear Jill Schoolman permitted me to pick from everything from his first inscription in a book to the first known piece of writing to the last shreds of text that Kafka wrote down when he was dying of tuberculosis of the larynx and couldn't speak anymore. They're all in this book. But this is from, uh, I think, his first book of writing, The Street Side Window. If you live withdrawn from the world and yet seek every now and then a point of contact with the flux of life, if cognizant of the changing time of day, the weather, working conditions and the like, you still seek some arm to link to yours, you won't get by for very long without a street side window. And even if a tired man, you were rather inclined to seek nothing at all, but turn to peer out the window just to bat your eyes open and shut between heaven and humanity, reluctantly, and with your head held back a bit, the clip-clop of the horses, the rattle of the carriages, and the hubbub of the street below will nevertheless drag you out of yourself, and so, at last, compel you to join the human cavalcade. 
Thank you for the range of voices, your own um, and those of your beloved authors. Um, I think we should close perhaps with one last uh, section, one last excerpt from Out of Breath, Out of Mind. This is a text in call entitled Last Conversation. It is in fact semi-autobiographical. Uh, it will be self-evident whom I'm speaking of. She lay with her bony skull pressed sideways on the pillow with sunken cheeks, her face somewhat skewed as if the celestial sculptor had miscalculated, leaping too much clay on the one side and not enough on the other. Her shrunken body was nothing more than skin and bones. When the potatoes are soft, you have to peel them, she muttered half asleep. Is man like a poem, I asked her. In general, she replied, what is your earliest memory? I dug a little deeper, gently stirring the little, left, the little life she had left. War. Why do you shake your head? I asked. Dumb world, she declared, her last words. That's very poignant. Um, in a time of many last words. Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you to all the viewers. Um, there are many riches on the St. Jordi website. Um, please click on uh, the link to uh, the books that Peter has read from. And please, of course, enjoy all the other conversations and readings that are available to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tess. Thank you, Marianne. Thank you, everybody out there. Be well. Zai gesund.